the, and I mentioned earlier that the biggest mistake you can make is not listening to what they're asking you to do. When you do that, you really spook people. If, if they're paying you, um, you know, they, they have a, a finite amount of money to hire you for however long. And if you're not performing, they, they get spooked and, you know, not listening to people. And I've, you know, I've done it where they, they've listed stuff. And maybe I did. I forgot to write it down. I forgot to do something. When you when when you present some work to a production designer or a director, and you haven't listened, the color just drains from their face, and they don't necessarily shout at you, but you you like oh yeah, you're, you're biting your fist. You think, and they say, well, why didn't you do this? It's like, yeah, I forgot. I and you did say, yep, yeah, I'm sorry, but that that it just doesn't cut it. So. Um, the worst mistake you can make is not listening to who you're working for because you know you know when you've scared them it will be easy to say today's guest is a complete creative savage but we'll do one better and give you an episode where we find out how they became one please welcome Matthew Savage an incredible concept designer who began his journey on Doctor Who to then working in the Halo Star Wars and Alien universes plus many more And in this episode, we discuss how the recent strikes have impacted Matt and his secrets to survive in the movie industry overall, all whilst managing parenthood. And in this episode, we discover many topics, such as the recent strikes that have impacted Matt and many artists, and his secrets to survive in the movie industry overall, all whilst managing parenthood. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast and I'm delighted to welcome on special guest today, Matthew Savage. Welcome Matt. Hi Aaron, good to see you again. You too. Um, I'm so happy that you're, you're on the episode. You've been on my, I have this like a long hit list and then there's <laughs> a particular names that I like, I'm just huge fans of. Um, so whilst this podcast is always about discovery, obviously meeting other creatives, there are some people on that list who I admire um from their work and everything else as well and you're one of them so thank you for jumping on um but save me just rambling on would you mind letting people know who you are and what you do sure uh i'm a concept designer uh primarily for film and tv um i've been doing it for ages now so i'm old um uh, i started about about 20 years ago on um on Doctor Who when that came back, uh, that was 2003 or four. Um, I did that for a couple of years. I did art direction TV, and then uh, I clawed my way into movies because uh, that was where I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, primarily do hard surface, techy, uh, proppy, uh, interiors, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I mean, a good 10, 15 years on site at studios. And then uh, just before COVID, um, working from home. Mm. Um, that, working from home because I wanted to be with my family as opposed to being away. Uh, and I've been working from home almost uh, exclusively since then. Cool. Do you prefer that one? Or is it, like you mentioned, obviously it's a necessity thing. Uh, I'm in a similar boat, so I can totally relate as to the reasonings behind it. But at the same time, take the responsibilities out of the way. Do you have a preference as to which one you prefer? I guess they have the pros and cons, right? Yeah, it's pros and cons. Uh, The pros of being on site. I always kind of see it as if you're on site at, say, Pinewood, you're uh, a filmmaker and you're part of the team. Mm. But when you're working from home, you're you feel more like more like a hired gun um so you know brought into troubleshoot specific things uh i've i love being in the mix i love being at the studio um i love having my lunch on on set you know going to see the bills <laughs> but you know as you know your priorities change and you you obviously love your family more that there's no comparison so it's like do we, do i get to see my kids take their first steps or do i get to have lunch at Pinewood and it, mm-hmm. there's no right now there's no comparison uh, they're 
they're getting older now, so maybe as they get into their teens, you know, things might change. I might go back to the studios more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, I love, I love both. Both feel like a, a privilege. Um, but right, right now, I'm firmly uh, in in dad mode. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally feel you, man. Um, and like, n- I guess not to get too heavy right away. Um, but do you find like you battle with it sometimes like having oh, to yeah obviously like the, the priorities are clear which is fine like that's a given mm-hmm. right um but like my, myself as a creative i've only worked remotely i've had other jobs where it's within amongst people mm-hmm. and i do miss that if i had a preference it would be the joys of flexibility of remote but in a physical place so but obviously you can't bring movie sets and projects into your own home no. you, you never know no. um but like do you just is that a battle for you or is that something that you have a good grasp on and it doesn't really bother you? Cause I know there's, I've most spoke to people where it's kind of like either or obviously mm. a little bit in between as well, but I'd love to hear your perspective given your experiences. Uh, right now there's no inner conflict at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the kids were born, I was still in career mode. Uh, and then for, t- I guess two or three years, um, I was really conflicted and I was, you know, I really enjoy work. I enjoy, um, the bouncing ideas around, you know, good set, see the construction, you meet the prop makers. Um, and we, my wife and I did that for a couple of years and then it just, we got to breaking point where, you know, if I, however many days I was away, she was a single mum mm. with two kids. I was, I was staying away. I, I was really missing the kids. And then I, that, that was kind of breaking point that we went, right. For however long I just want to work from home. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it meant annoying some people. It meant um, turning some really exciting stuff down. Uh, but I think, you know, not, not to get too deep, too soon, you kind of have to think, what are you going to regret in 20 years? Are you going to regret, regret not hearing your kids speak, you know, say their first words? Or are you going to re- regret turning a movie down? And it's like, well, you know, when you come to that realization, the conflict's gone. But mm-hmm. it, it can take a while for you to get to that, you know, epiphany moment. Yeah, now for sure. Um, what was the switch like? Was it like, um, and then you touched on me a little bit there, like obviously it did maybe, maybe ruffling feathers is a incorrect way to describe it, but obviously it would cause maybe a bit of disruption um, or there was some friction involved, um, at least perhaps with clients or projects. But how did you make the switch? Like, was it something that you did abruptly did you plan it um uh, yeah or did it all kind of cu- not, not fall but normally with this kind of stuff it collapses into place and then you just yeah it afterwards? well i mean it, i was on uh rise of skywalker in uh 2018 and my eldest i can't remember must have been five going to school youngest was three right and i had a i just had this crunch week where um i had to have a meeting with the director and I think he, I think they were shooting. So he was like, well, he can meet you at lunchtime on Wednesday. So I went, I was in the studio and I was going home Wednesday evening for, so I could do my half of the childcare. And the meeting obviously got pushed. So, okay, well, we'll meet on wrap on Wednesday. Okay, so I'll stay to the end of the day. I'll, I, I'll still be home by nine o'clock. You stay to the end of the day, right? The meeting has been pushed to tomorrow morning. Okay, you phone home, you organize childcare. I'll be back tomorrow morning. I have the meeting. And that just happened all week. And in the end, the meeting didn't happen. And I annoyed everyone at work. Mm -hmm. I annoyed everyone at home. Um, I I felt like I couldn't have worked any harder and everything, everything still went wrong. So that, that was like, like, I'm going to, after this job, I'm only going to take stuff from home. And it was a case of, can I work from home? No. Okay. Can I work from home? Yes. Right. I'll take, I'll work for you. And um, that was it. So there was a clear point where it was just, it was just way too much. Mm. Um, it's, it's way easier now. The kids are older. The kids mm. are now uh, 11 and 8. Cool. So they're both in school. Everything's calmed down. Work. Uh, what was interesting, though, was working from home. I actually got some of the best and most interesting jobs from home. Cool. Um, okay, I, I worked on Halo for two years um and i've I've just done alien from home 
and that's the best job I've ever had. Wow. <laughs> the, the most fun I've ever had in work. Uh, I, I got to go to set, I went over to Hungary where they were shooting, so I got to visit them. But the whole job was remote, and we just we zoomed. Uh, the concept guys zoomed each other every day or every other day. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of thought like, oh, that's it. My career's over. I'm only going to do, or I'm just going to take, you know, whatever. If it's Thomas the Tank Engine, if it's from home, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. But actually it kind of, it weeded out a couple of other jobs. And um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll go back now, but we'll, we'll mm-hmm. see. Uh, that's, that's fascinating to hear. Um, and it also shows that, Obviously, we always hear like the the grass is always greener, but I guess no. in your situation, it wasn't even about looking what color the grass was. It was just finding a place to sit on the field and figure yeah. it out. <laughs> um, but then I guess it also shows that each one brings different opportunities. And you probably sit here, let's say in a different timeline, um, you stayed with that current situation. Mm. You probably said a similar kind of thing, like there are these certain projects that I would never have had. Um, but I guess, I mean, do you get a lot of listeners who are completely fresh in their journey and figuring mm. things out? And um, it's important to hear, like, almost every situation, and I'm sure you'd agree, has a pro and a con, as you just described. Um, Do you think there's, like, a particular way to handle that? Like, do you psych yourself up or anything? Or do you have, like, say, a certain approach to when changes happen? Because I guess the nature of our business, one thing you could say is, as opposed to generating ideas and offering solutions, is dealing with constant change. But this inner project or as you've described in life as well um is that something that you organically do or do you have like a particular process like a, i guess maybe a better way to ask is do you have like a sort of troubleshooting way to handle the challenges that our industry throws uh, i think if every job was the same i think i would have developed a coping mechanism right right <laughs> because every job is <laughs> every job is different every client is different there's no there's no hard and fast way. And you kind of, if you, I, I worked with a production designer for two years on Halo and we had our um, complete pipeline worked out. Mm. You know, I'd get reference from her. I would do the set or the, the prop. I'd give it to the art director. Um, and we had that whole thing worked out. Then on the next job, I worked with someone else and it's completely different. So the only like the only coping mechanism you can have really is to be uh com- prepared to do anything and yes. manage different people um they're going to manage you differently uh i i'm quite chill about that now when i was starting i found that completely intimidating because wow. you just like to know uh here's a brief you need to fulfill this aspect of the the script you know you um but the film industry i think video games then it's not like that it's so scatty and unpredictable that it kind of it it attracts people who are, who become okay with going today is going to be yeah <laughs> you know this kind of day um yeah you know tomorrow is going to be you know different and sometimes on the job you might start i've uh, on some movies, I started in one department, and when they've exhausted everything they need doing, they might move me to costume or to props, and then the person you're working for, he or she, is going to have a completely different way yeah. of working. And then sometimes you might work uh, for a director who's never used concept guys before. You know, maybe he or she has come from uh, lower budget TV or some, you know. And they, they, they see the art department, they see they've got all these people ready to fulfill their vision. Mm-hmm. And you can see they kind of clam up and they don't know how to, they don't know how to manage it. Maybe they don't know mm-hmm. how to read sketches. So you have to find a way to keep them comfortable without mm-hmm. scaring them. Because if you scare them, you get fired. So- yes. <laughs> yes. No, that's, that's, that's so true. And um, I like the way you explained quite very clearly like how it's always different do Mm. you think that will ever change or that's the cycle that's the ecosystem that's That's the way it is is it yeah (laughs) but maybe if you worked for a video game company maybe if you work in-house uh for did uh for ilm or lucasfilm um uh, doug chang has uh, you know a very established team maybe 
But even then you have directors coming in. Um, the chemical mix is always going to be different, I guess. So, no, just get used to, to rolling with the punches all the time. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, obviously, like early on that it was something intimidating, which I think everybody experiences with mm. anything when you start something new, especially okay. when it's like a career. Like, you yeah. add the word create something and it just, you know, like um, blows up exponentially. Um, do you still have any of those feelings now? Or has that completely just become part of the process? Yeah, I want to go right up to the mic and say, every job. <laughs> it, 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 well, so, I mean, I've gone from job to job with the same team. Yeah. And there's a level of comfort. Every time I start a new job with a new director or a new designer, there's absolutely um, a level of not... Angst is probably too strong a word, but intrepidation, I'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly if it's a job you're very excited to do. Because we all have, um, as a freelancer, you have a job uh, that's paying the bills, and then the next one could be on an established sort of cinematic universal IP that you love. So you're really heightened, and um, that, our, our Alien was a dream job. Um, and there were some really great people on that. And I was, I, I don't know, not, not anxious, but like there, there's a level of like, just work, do it again, work harder, go again, yeah. go again. So I, I don't think it goes away. You, you, I think you, you learn to manage it more, the more you do. Um, and I think when you've been let go from a couple of big jobs quite early, which I have, I've, I've, had quote unquote dream jobs that lasted three or four days because it didn't work. Yeah. You do a few of those and it, it, it does burn, but equally you go, well, if it wasn't working, you, you get better at managing mm. the paranoia and the angst. I, it doesn't go away. You just, you can control it a bit more. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, a lot of that, what I'm asking is, I know it's like a general question. I've always had mm. that. I'm sure you do when you start that as well. But it's also stuff that's kind of semi-biographical in my own journey as well. Like the whole getting in let go or like, especially the freelance stuff, how quickly things begin and abruptly end. Like, it's brutal. You, when it, yeah. When, yeah. It's like you, you kind of get used to it without getting used to it. And no. it takes, a, I don't know how it is for you, but it takes a while to kind of like process that and mm -hmm. move on. And do you ever get like... Uh, you know, like, I guess over the last 12 months, it's happened maybe a bit more regularly than I would have liked. Um, but I understand the reasons why, um, mm. as as to what it is. And some I can accept, some perhaps like, okay, I need to improve on stuff. Some was just the nature of how things were, like, because out of everyone's control, which is mm -hmm. totally fine. It's life, you know, things happen. Um, but how do you kind of deal with that? Because I would say at this point in time, the, that little voice in the back of the head is maybe like, maybe just find something else to do. That's maybe a little more stable or to be play it safe. Maybe you're yeah. not cut out for this kind of thing. And you know, that's an imposter syndrome thing. Um, how do you deal with that? Because obviously, um, as you've said, that's something that you've had to go through a lot. Yeah. Um, is there like maybe any advice you can give to people like myself and others who are thinking that particular way um where they are thinking maybe give it like, have you ever thought actually yeah maybe the question is have you ever thought about packing it in and giving up um no i i haven't yet because mm -hmm. there's nothing else i can do yes. um i'm sort of i'm i'm locked into this now and i've committed so much time um i definitely there's nothing else i mean i'd like to do other things maybe within the film industry but i there's nothing else no i i'm in i'm a lifer now it's 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 way too late. Love it. And in terms of dealing, that again, it comes with age and it comes with experience. I did, I, I'll be careful with um, not naming jobs, but I, I did a job where my uh, client wanted to keep a Skype window open all day. So every time he was at his desk, we could talk. It was almost like he wanted to be next week, yes. next week but remote. It's like, oh, but it was so. It was it was a fun job, but then you know it didn't work out, and he he let me go, and I was yeah you know, I was super cross for about an hour, and then you know my wife said, "Do you want 
you know, do you want that job? I said, well, no, but said, well, don't you work away, walk away. It's not, if, if it's not working, it's really hard. I would never sort of go straight in. If, it, if a young concept artist had just lost their job, I'd, I'd, I'd be really sensitive and I'd give them a week or two, but then you, you have to go back and go, well, if it wasn't working, um, you're better off out, you know, yes. you, you just, you have to look at it that way. And you, you really are, you're better off not doing it. Um, you don't want to hear that on the, on the day because you're either very upset or you're very mm -hmm. tired, but you know, it, that was, that was for the best. Um, mm. and that, again, that's come from, I've had, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. I know, I know like the best of the best people who have been on a job, uh, on a, their dream job. And they didn't click with the director or the director didn't like yeah. the work. And they, they were gone after a couple of days or a week. I think, right, that guy, that guy's gone. You know what? It's like, that's when imposter syndrome kicks in. But it's just, a, it's a chemical balance. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a relationship. And if it doesn't work, when it works, it's, it's wonderful. Like mm -hmm. it's like having, working for a great friend who's, you know, you're working towards the same thing. If it doesn't work, you, you, you are better off out of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, people saying, oh, you're better off out of it is a real cop out. You know, that, that's kind of your go to yeah. uh, platitude when someone has bad news, but that it is true. No, I absolutely agree. And I'm glad how you described it. Like they said, you're a life and there's no other way. Um, when you mentioned that, like I had this same dilemma, like about before even getting to industry, it was a case of, I got into industry quite late, like uh, when I hit 30. Um, and prior to that, it was a case of, do I even bother? Like, how long do you pursue the dream? Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a case of that conclusion, that very thing where it's like, I don't want to do anything else and I can't no. do anything else. And it has to be this and you kind of figure it out, but it, you know, it's one of those kind of things here and there. Um, and I guess equally, you know, like I have worked in other industries where it's definitely way more brutal in terms of like just surviving. Mm -hmm. So I do remind myself in, in that instance as well. Um, but I also like how you mentioned that it is something that you just need to kind of, you know, like not so much accept, but acknowledge not being in it. Because I guess there's always that thing where you think, you want to make it work. You, you think you can just work hard. You can work your way through it. Mm. But maybe sometimes it's a case of like, it just needs to end. It's a bit like with a project, right? Like you're doing a piece of art. You spent maybe, you know, let's say a month on it. When in another instance, you could spend maybe a week and it's done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just want to, it's best to start fresh and do it all over again. Um, I'd love to know more about how you got into the industry. Um, you've like, I think, of all of our guests so far on the Lensword podcast, your IMDB might be one of the most extensive. Um, and it's one of the coolest looking ones as well, for sure. So, but like, I'd love to know Matt, the Matt who wanted to break into the industry and what led him to being the person that you are today. Sure. Well, I grew up not knowing the term concept designer because in, in the nineties, without the internet, it was a, a much rarer, uh, term much rarer job. Um, I was aware that people could, um, I guess it was called illustration. You know, I don't even think people referred to Ralph Macquarie necessarily as a concept artist. He was an illustrator. Yeah. Uh, same with Ron Cobb. Um, all the people that really inspired me. Uh, I did a sort of product multimedia degree. Um, and I, Graduated 2002 with no portfolio of note. Um, and that, that was when I decided to get into film. So I, I had a, a degree that wasn't necessarily relevant. I didn't have any uh, portfolio work. So I, I, I kind of went back to formula and uh, built up a portfolio of work. Um, I phoned, literally cold called Pinewood, different studios, and I, I got in on a, a work experience on a, a Thunderbirds movie. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, work experience was basically making tea and coffee, uh, a runner. It was like a, not even quite a, a runner. And I went to see 
the concept guys on that movie and I, you know, and I was, I had my portfolio and I felt full of myself and I saw their works. So, oh my goodness me. That, this is why you're making tea and coffee because <laughs> you, you right now you can't compete. You know, you have to, you have to keep working. But I was, I had my foot in the door making tea and coffee, um, maybe designing the odd prop. <clears throat> So I did that, and then I had a I had a, a full time uh, job on Batman Begins, and that was uh, again art department assistant, which is the entry level job. Mm -hmm. Again, my work nowhere near good enough. You know, they 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 were very generous, and they gave me props to do. Um, it's not low impact stuff, but kind of just you, you do that in your evening if you want to. That's fine. Um, but, but that job as an assistant, I got to meet everyone, you know, you, you're running drawings to different departments. You go to the DOP, you go to the chippies and the plasterers. So you, you get this overview of the, the studio and you get to see the tumbler, you know, on your, on your morning, uh, walk around the studio, delivering drawings. So, well, I'm not being paid much and I'm, I'm the, the bottom of the run, but I'm on a, the Batman movie. So I was absolutely yes. thrilled. Um, and then, uh, following that, I got my first concept job on Doctor Who again, which is a very, very low paid, um, uh, very quick turnaround, but that was the best sort of baptism by fire because it was, that show is one week sci-fi, then period, mm -hmm. contemporary, um, and it, and that's where I kind of got my my fairly quick workflow. Was occasionally like design it today, they're building it tomorrow. It's on set the, the day after. It would be that, yeah, not every day, but some days would be super quick turnaround, yeah. um, and, and then very slowly into into movies. So I kind of I. I decided I wanted to get somewhere and then it took, you know, five, 10 years of mm. slowly trying to compete with, you know, the, my contemporaries. And I, I was kind of working around incredibly talented people. Yes. No, when like not, as soon as you go, I'm not on their level, it's, but that's okay. You just, just keep going. You know, they're, you're here. They've somehow, they've, they've let you into the room. Yes. Um, don't annoy anyone, just, you know, help out where you can learn from who you can. And then you slowly, you know, you slowly start to climb the, the tree a bit. Mm. What was one of the first things that you picked up that you thought, aha, like, okay, why did I not do this earlier? Or that's genius. And it's kind of became at that point, perhaps maybe it's changed now. Um, something that you became part of your workflow. Um, I'd say really uh, going back, if it's a prop or a set, really go back and read the script, read the descriptions, read uh, the the scene directions, what it needs to do, because you can let the, the script and your, your reference and research do the work for you. It's almost like letting it design itself. If you go, well, this, this weapon has to have there's a scene where he reloads it or there's a scope. You can kind of pick out the bones of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And then you're styling over the top of whatever silhouette you've, you've come up with. So, and listen, like listen to the production designer or the director. If they, if they've emailed you a brief or some notes, read it, you read it again, go and work for an hour, go back and read it again. Because if you, when you miss a note that they've given you, that oh, that really riles people and it, it scares people. And when you get that yes. piece of work back and in red, uh, they've they've drawn on it in a red pen. They've gone, I asked for this, you know. It's like, ah, oh, you did, and I, I know you did, and I just didn't, I didn't listen or I didn't take it on board. Yeah, just read, read, read all you know, every everything you can, script, feedback. You just stay on top of that because that makes your life so much easier. Interesting. So it's more a case of like just, yeah, like understand basically like not only just seeing the brief, but really understand it and 
pick it apart almost. Yeah. Did you uh, do you think you found like maybe maybe not secrets but like some better avenues to explore whatever you were doing just by doing that as opposed to even before you even like start making marks and exploring volumes and shapes for example just purely from reading the text and the notes i do you know i love if it's really rare occasionally i'll get the brief on a friday afternoon and i'll have two days just to let that kind of ferment in your brain mm. um the more thinking and research and quiet time you can have um like a, a couple of years ago i was i did a, a, a job for a friend and he we spoke about it in december and he said well we'll bring you one in january so i had i had two weeks of and i, I it didn't feel like work but i was just going just thinking away and i came back in on the monday and having had two weeks of thinking i just it just happened straight away um that's not to say doing it straight off the bat isn't bad you know that that sometimes yes. great stuff can come from just the pressure of doing it but um a couple of designers early on really hammered home uh research mood boards um remember you're a storytelling you're a filmmaker the um everyone on a movie set is a filmmaker and a storyteller mm. that's the 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 baseline you know it, the pe the people who paint the props are painting a story on there they're painting uh, the age of the prop or the, you know the something that just kind of it, it's kind of texture on the screen mm -hmm. but it does it does contribute to the overall story so mm. um yeah just the the more you can do kind of head work the better mm. cool and what's i guess what's it like on a, on a film set like it, it, you always see like chaos and just beautiful chaos if you're just watching it from afar <laughs> But what is it like on a film set? It's like, um, uh, I mean, I've never been in the army, so the, it, but I'm, I'm told it's like being, people have referred to it as being at war in that you have half an hour of extreme tension, stress, and then four hours of nothing. And, you know, peace and quiet whilst something else is happening. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I don't work on set. I go and visit set. I, I'm not. Um, right. a member of the shooting crew but i love like i love going to set that's one of the reasons i i do more film than video games because mm -hmm. it's pure magic down there it's a um it's a privilege to go because when a set is lit and dressed it's like that for maybe one or two days uh because studio space is so expensive as soon as they're done they strike it Either the lights yes. go off props go away um it's you know it, it's like this tiny window that you get to go and see something amazing and these huge expensive sets that might be up for a week um six months of build shoot for a week and then they're 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 struck and they're taken down so i love it it's it's pure magic um sick yeah it's the best it, i and if you've been involved in the set or you help design it and you can see some some throwaway mark you you put on your drawing, and some someone's taken the time to draw that up technically. Uh, it's gone to the plaster shop. It's, the the chippies have worked on it. Then it's been painted. You think I that was like a throwaway thing, but someone's yeah. spent weeks taking that incredibly seriously. That is like it's a total privilege to go and see that. Wow. I mean, yeah, like if there ever was any, well, I guess there's many, um, but I think films is one of the ways you can really truly appreciate a pipeline from beginning to end and everything that connects into it and gets taken out of it and, and whatnot. Um, like with with film itself, does it ever get, sorry, back, back to the film set, sorry, does it ever get boring? Do you ever get bored of it or is it always? Uh, I, I don't. Um, you get a bit complacent because. Um... If you see anything all day, every day, you, it, the shine goes a bit. But yes, yes. Then you you just feel like a dick because like no one else gets to see it, and you can you can shake that yeah. off. Uh, when I was on one of uh, the Star Wars, they had we were in a studio above, we were in the offices above the studio where the Millennium Falcon was, and me and uh, my buddy Chris Roseborn walked under the falcon to lunch every day 
And the first two days, like, oh, dude, this is so cool. And then by Wednesday, Thursday, you you don't even look up. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that, that's. Uh, but I think I don't know. There, there's a definite charm to that. Like, I guess to get you know, maybe philosophical. Like, no matter mm. what awesomeness you see in front of you, how it was made, the human mind will always just get desensitized to it. Totally. Like, there's very yeah. few things that you can just constantly be in awe of um and yeah like i mean i guess that's why people have addictive personalities like myself are always kind of looking for that same hit again and again or new ones um but then at the same time maybe like it's always like a moment of reflection where you think wow that was awesome yeah. or when that kind of awesome thing hasn't happened again you're thinking that was great it's, like, you know, like, it's really yeah. tricky you're kind of you 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 end up chasing different highs as well yeah um because uh, Alien, which I finished earlier this year, was a, a complete high. Um, and you have to recognize that I'm not going to have the same emotional high on the next job because it, it, it can't be that important to me again. Until, the, and, you know, maybe something else in four or five years that will spike again. Um, and, yeah, you, you're right. You kind of, uh, I can't remember how you, you put it just now, but you kind of, you have to manage wow, this is amazing. And I it's become mundane. Actually, remember, just remember how special this mm -hmm. is. And, and also, if you could, uh, you know, the 15-year-old the me would be so cross with me now if I wasn't bouncing around excited about everything. Yes. Because he wouldn't, he wouldn't believe that you get, to, you get to do all of this stuff. So you, you, you can check yourself every now and again and remember, like, it's, it's super cool. Oh, no, for sure. Um, and I think that's, a, I guess, a message to any professional in any career, especially one that you want to do, um, for sure. Because, like, work, no matter what you do, is work. Mm -hmm. Like, it's maybe it will never, by nature, it can't be a positive mm -hmm. because work always means it's a cost of something, either of energy or of output and not almost everything combined. So no matter what you're doing, um, Anything on a job um, will always hit you. It will get tedious. You get bored. You get like fatigued, obviously. And these are all natural things. Um, and sometimes you can be like, oh, why am I doing this? Mm. Um, but then, you know, you remind yourself, especially in our career, like, like the stuff that yeah. we get to do, it is very, very cool. Yeah. And and what, do you want to get a real yeah. job? You know? Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I've been there. I don't want you, to go back. You get, you get to do something you love. And you're right. It is a job. Um, they're compensating you with money for your time. So it is a business ag agreement and arrangement, but equally you spent the time to get to a point where you can do something you enjoy for, for work. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you do, you have to remember not to moan because I, I remember when I started, I, I'd look at concept guys who are my age now and they were moaning about the job moaning about this and that and i'm thinking i want your job so badly why how why are you moaning about this and then you you know you get 20 years into your career and you you do get a bit jaded you know the shine has yes. come off it a bit um but then you know i you, you get to meet new people you get to, as a freelancer if the job's going badly you only have to stick it out for mm -hmm. five months six months that's not like having a full-time job it's somewhere you hate where you're going to be there for the rest of your life. You know what? Well, I can stick out a year on a job I, I'm not enjoying because yes. it, it will come to an end and you can leave on good terms. So I just like do the work, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's not that bad. No, for sure. And I think, yeah, like it's, I think that's, that's definitely a positive. What I like about the industry, like almost everything is finite. Like mm -hmm. there's nothing that is perpetual. Um, obviously there are certain IPs that will always continue going, but things shift, things change and, or maybe you shift and you change and you pivot to something else. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's definite, definite value. Oh, well, I guess one thing you can define a dead uh, industry by is deadlines. There's always a deadline. And even with the job, like it will end and you have mm -hmm. to move on whether you like it or not. Um, the Lord of the Rings, uh, special edition, extended edition is proof of that. <laughs> awesome for the however many hours it is, and then it, it's over, and they move it's on. It's finite, and they yeah. Do, but yeah. it's timeless. Um, but I, I really appreciate that because there is something about, uh, obviously, we're parents. We know there's like, when you're looking after kids and all responsibilities, there's certain pockets 
of time or certain limits of time you have to do things, but they must be done. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get done, they're going to have to get done another time and it becomes a shit show until it's not. Um, but then when it all clicks, when it all works, it's amazing. Yeah. And um, yeah, like, I, I love that bit about the industry. Um, so I've lost my train of thought a little bit, what I was going to ask as a follow-up question. But yeah, like with, with terms of, actually, yeah, uh, to go back a little bit, mm. you mentioned that we, we spoke a little bit about how um, you know the nature of work and it can get tedious and it can get fatigued. Have you ever experienced a situation where you have found yourself, maybe that's getting you a bit too much and it's affecting either your work or maybe the team around you? Um, I mean, it's definitely... Or even, no... or even vice versa. Yeah, working room... <sighs> I mean, I can't say what the job was, but I was on a job um, where I was in more of a lead position and uh, the, the whole thing was going south. It wasn't a particularly enjoyable job for anyone. And I, I remember sort of standing back and thinking, you're not being the best lead right now that, you know, when they can see that you're not having a good time, you, you know, you have to go back in tomorrow. You have to be in a good mood. Um, I, I'm pretty good at, at recognizing where I am emotionally. I mean, it, it's much easier doing that from home because you're, uh, you don't feel the stress that everyone else is feeling unless you get a really ratty Zoom call. Um, but it's, I mean, again, it's sort of an age thing. You, you get better at noticing your levels and where you are. Um, I don't, I never used to get burnout. I, I, I am getting burnout now, mm -hmm. um, for the first time, which is quite scary. No, I'm not, I mean, I've been off work for the summer because of the, the strike. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm having no burnout right now because I'm super chill apart mm -hmm. from the fact we're not working, but, um, yeah. I'm not sure if that how, answers your question or not. No, for sure. Um, how have you found that time off? Like, obviously, it's it's um, unwanted. It's almost a bit like a kind of weird redundancy type situation. Like, I, I've been made redundant before, and it was not cool. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that forced rest did help in a certain way. Um, even though I realized later on in life, as opposed to at that time. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, what have you done in that time during the strike? Like, has well, it been? Focusing on work or been switching off completely? It's sort of like having kids. There's no good time to have kids and there's no good time yes. to be out of work. Um, but yeah, the timing was great because it, it came in just before the summer holiday. So I had mm. six weeks off with the kids. Uh, we moved house. I've, I've been desperate to learn Blender for about five years. And we, as you know, with working kids, there's no spare time. I have no, there, and you know, maybe, yes, I could start at 10 in the evening, but I, you're, you're not, Blender's not going to get the best of me, um, you know, for half an hour before I crash out. Yeah. Um, so I've been, I've been learning Blender, which I've really enjoyed. Um, I, I miss the, the structure of work. Um, regime and structures become really important to me so wake up exercise work see your family have dinner go to bed do it again um that's almost the the key to my mental health now mm -hmm. is just do it and do it every day just do the same thing eat relatively healthily and you know go again go again so i, I don't like not having the structure of a job um I'm going back to work on Monday, which is great. Um, but it's been it's been fine. I mean, I never, and I'm sure you and everyone else is the same. Freelancers never really enjoy time off because you don't know how long it's going to last. Yeah, you know. So it's like relax. You're not working, but equally, I can't not work forever. Um, so I I always I I chill out the most when I, I finish a job and I know I'm going back in two weeks time, four weeks time, yeah. even if it's like six weeks time, I know you can manage money and you can do this and that. Uh, but it, it hasn't been bad. I'm desperate to crack on and get my teeth into yeah. a job. Have you taken any prolonged breaks in your career up to this point? Like, um, 
has there been any strike action that you've experienced before where it stopped production or even just like took some time out for yourself? I guess like yeah. what's the longest time you've taken out uh, intentionally? The, yeah, well, there was the, the writer's strike in 2007 and I wasn't established particularly well at that point. I, I'd done a few, a few jobs uh, and that was a long year. But then equally, I didn't have kids. We didn't have a huge mortgage. Um, like it was almost, um, my wife's always been in full-time employment. So we, uh, it was a bit stressful, but it was, it was fine. This one's been a bit more um, stressful money-wise. Uh, I did take, I took a, uh, probably five or six months off when both of the kids were born. I worked up to the day they were born and then um, just took that time off just to be at home, be a dad, maybe do dailies on some job here and there. Uh, so that I, I I did that as a just as you know to experience dad life and you know get to know the the kids when they were babies and establish that relationship. Yeah. So I, I I did take months off when they were both born, uh, but by that we, we had the strike in two thousand and seven, and work has been consistently and increasingly busy in the UK. Uh, so I I hope after this kind of mammoth strike, this is the worst one. Um, mm -hmm. It's the worst one I've ever seen. I think it's the worst one we've had because we had actors and writers on strike at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think that happened maybe in the the 50s or the 60s. It's quite, it's a rare thing to happen. Um, so I'm hoping we're going to have, you know, another 10, 15 years of um, opulence and, you know, uh, fingers crossed yeah. it's, it's, it's been so busy uh, you know and the the rise of the streaming platforms all of that stuff has just contributed to new studios being built new tv shows being made mm. movies less fewer movies more tv shows i mean i guess it's hard to predict it's always is hard to predict the future well it's impossible to predict mm. the future um but i guess you can always look at trends and based on your experiences based on obviously you did experience the previous mm. strike and you saw what happened afterwards what do you anticipate will happen going forward? Do you think it will kind of go through maybe a similar kind of wave again? Um, or do you think things will change um, a little bit differently or no idea? I, I couldn't even begin to call what's going to happen now. Yeah. Um, because I don't know. Streaming platforms have, have made us really busy here for, I guess, five. The last five years has been uh, crew shortages in the UK. Um, because, you know, we have the movies being made here and then, um, the TV shows now, um, require movie crews as opposed to TV crews. And that line has become completely blurred. Um, but now streaming isn't doing so well. And I know Disney have canceled a, some shows. So I, I couldn't even begin to predict because I, I'm just going to be wrong in five years. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe um, movies will come back. Yeah. Maybe movies will be bigger. That That's all I've got. <laughs> yeah. No, no, fair enough. Um, In terms of like your time, like with, with the strike and stuff, for example, uh, was it sudden when you found out? Like, was it almost like it stopped or did you get you guys get a heads up? Um, yeah. You, I mean, you could see, you know, if it's a train coming around, you could see the smoke coming over the hill. Uh, I think it was in the offing for a year before, certainly kind of four or five months before my friends were going, strike's going to happen. Yeah, you know, it's going to happen. It's like, no, it would be fine. it would be fine. Then the strike did happen and we kept going. Probably for, I, w I worked four or five weeks into the writer's strike and then the, the actors kicked off and everything closed down. Yeah. Um, any anything of anything that involved American uh, union members. So I mean, all all the moves at Pinewood, Shepton, and, and that happened quite quickly. The, the you know the cascade of things shutting down. But it, it was, um, I mean, it's like COVID. You know, you could see it coming. And it'd be fine. It'd be fine. It'd be fine. Right, we're all <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's not fine. It's it's here. So so yeah, we we did. Uh, I mean, I guess it's like, and and through that time, obviously, you would have been speaking with a lot of your colleagues, a lot of people that you work with in the industry, and obviously with your own thoughts as well. 
what was going through your mind at the time? Like, was it a case of, okay, we just got to stick it out, trying mm-hmm. to make things work? Or was it strategizing thing? Okay, I got to do something else. No, this is the time to maybe do that thing I was putting off. Like, what was you going through? At that yeah, time? the I was, I've been waiting. I mean, it took a writer and an actor strike for me to learn Blender. <laughs> that, that's kind of, if I've ever had, because I, I don't know how you learn software, but I need to give it my full attention you know monday to friday nine to five right otherwise it doesn't go in um i can't do half an hour in the evening i need to go right this is today this is your job you know treat it like work and do the same hours as if you were doing a job so i i i knew you know we were always going to go back to work um they're all the the studios are too big to not make movies and tv shows so we we were always going to go back just how long can you wait how i'm um, mm. sort of at, at the limit of um i'm going back on monday so it's all fine but any longer and i'd be uh again a bit a bit nervous but mm. uh, no blender was my thing uh i did during the strike um i i, I was going to do blender in covid but then um you know you can't learn blender in a house where your kids are being homeschooled yeah. downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> no totally um yeah like the whole um covid thing at our house was just my productivity levels and my growth as an artist plummeted like yeah. it was almost stagnant until they went back to school because as you know we kids like they just need so much yeah. resource and time and energy yeah. from yourselves. And um, it's impossible to not give that. And you shouldn't not, not give that when mm-hmm. they need it. Um, something has to give. And it's yeah. always like something that you sacrifice yourself. As you know, it's like being a new parent. Mostly it's always sleep at the beginning. Um, and then it, <laughs> that face says it all. Um, and then it's other things here and there. Um, but yeah, like I totally understand that. Mm. And I guess on one hand though, when you realize when you don't do something um you do tend to just ignore or you realize what you didn't really need to do because mm-hmm. you just you forgot about it but then the ones that are kind of like i still i can't wait to get back to that or I really want to learn this you kind of know what's a priority um what were you using before blender uh modo which i i think by all accounts is quite similar uh yeah, I, it is yeah i'd say yeah I, I i prefer the modeling in modo to blender but the the rendering and the 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 lighting like blend you just can't touch it it's so much better yeah. quicker um and dare i say it fun i mean learning software is agony i i find it for however long week two weeks it's just pain and then all yes. of a sudden it becomes really fun you know that and that's kind of the um the reward for sticking it out uh so i i love learning software but i just need to do it by myself um I can't do it on a job. I'm not that kind of person. I know some people mm-hmm. will, will learn software on a job, but I, I'm too paranoid about I, I need to produce the work today, so I always yes. fall back on, you know, what I can do. Um, in, now, in Mobo. I totally concur. Like my um, intro into 3D was originally Alias, but it basically the, the, what slim to Blender was Maya, and even when I started using Blender, mm. I still kind of kept Maya there yeah. just for stuff because i know what i can get away with mm-hmm. when it needs to be done and blend i'm still figuring it out i didn't know how to fix things when i broke things yeah. <laughs> in maya i, I kind of do um and i'm going for that with unreal now at the moment but like but you're right in what you say like it is painful um until something clicks and thinking, yeah. oh, okay yeah. and then you know the, the floodlights open um but I, I, i'm similar to yourself i enjoy it when there's not a need for me yeah. to do it like i'll happily just pluck you know plod around figure mm-hmm. things out what does this what does that do but yeah when it comes to a job it's like oh well, i need to do it by this time definitely and yeah yeah you waste so much i mean it's not a waste but when you're doing it as part of a job and you're trying to learn at the same time some simple things yeah, can yeah, take yeah. An, an age so is blender your go-to now is uh, that no i i'm running the two parallel um i i haven't had time to get the modeling down i decided to uh the first thing i'd learn is their lighting and texturing the node system Mm -hmm. so i can i'm always kind of planning for a job to phone that day so if if i had to go back i could model in modo and render in uh blender 
Mm-hmm. So that that's where I am. Uh, I can do a bit of the modeling in Blender, but even like my muscle memory is just still holding me back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I would love if I could just take a year off and just do my own thing nine to five, but you know, that's not going to happen to I retired. So, <laughs> and how long did it take you to get into mold? Or was that something that you, um, fell into or was that recommended? Or, uh, that was yeah, a complete prior? necessity on, I was on the force awakens. I was using SketchUp and, uh, I was just, I was really at my depth and I saw the stuff I was in the UK. I was seeing the stuff coming from ILM and they were all using Modo. And I was just like, deep breath time, you are, you are not competing with them. You are not on the same level yeah. at all. So we had uh, a two week stand down when they were doing script work. And I just, I went nine to five, Monday to Friday, learning Modo. And I, I got the, the basics in in two weeks, enough to go back to work and use it. Uh, but that, that was a kind of a, not a shotgun, you know, being held to your back, but I really mm-hmm. felt like you, you, you'll find times in your career where you just think I have got to contend on their level or mm. you're going to go. And, you know, I think SketchUp had really served me well up to that point, but I just had to use, you know, big boy software <laughs> at that <laughs> point. And do you see anything else on the horizon happening now? Like is is your switch to Blender purely the, for the obvious reasons as how popular it is and obviously it's free and what it can do um or is it more so it's almost industry standard now i i industry standard i really love the community uh the uh, on youtube you can just find stuff you know i i have a scene i need to make it snow or i need a, a thunderstorm <laughs> or it, it's just out there and i that i can't find that for any other software package where you can just uh and i think that's happened because it's free and mm-hmm. kids with no job and no kids and no kids of their own have just become these absolute wizards. Uh, and and they share, you know, they share their info. Um, so oh, I need volumetric lighting or I need reflections in the, the concrete. And you can just do it straight away. Mm. Um, so uh, if you have a base knowledge and, and you need to bolster it on a, because every job is different, you might be doing arctic snowy you know icebergs whatever you can just you can just dip in and and do it Mm. so i I love the community i love um i mean the fact is free is just insane you know when when i started you know maya was the i think it's still is maya still the industry standard for um i think i think animation or big product i think there's definitely a specific use for it yeah. because of how integrated it is into the industry yeah um but that my was it yeah, you know yeah. and it's so expensive and you're like well how am i gonna i'm a student I, how am i gonna learn my well you know where can i where can i get a copy probably be a hack copy where, where now you know we've all done the, the donut tutorial um yes. it's just all out there and it's like this um you know, it's, it's free. So it's, it's, a, it's incredible. And it's completely different to the environment I uh, began in. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, it's fascinating. Like, I am, I remember going through college in uni, it was at uni, I graduated in 2010. So in the last couple of years, that was when there were more maybe tutorials, there's mm-hmm. an Omen stuff out the DVDs still wasn't too yeah. many internet related stuff yet. But prior to that, it was the case of learning from textbooks you're oh waiting on your goodness. lecturers and all that kind you, of stuff and kids wouldn't believe yeah. that would they if you like, yeah. you got this textbook which is as big as a phone book i said like, what well, you it's kind of like you know it's a wax on wax off you're going to have to learn everything in order uh I, I, and you're not going to be match fit for nope. a year <laughs> yeah yeah now it's i mean i i i'm glad that I kind of went through that because I think they do offer different things, mm. but but obviously the the ease of use, the or maybe the how accessible things are, is a dream. Because back then it was a case of I wish I had some information that I can get to right away, um, as opposed to having to crawl through things and mm. know there's a limitation, and then you literally hit the limitation and find a way around that. Um, are there any other things? That maybe you're looking, keeping an eye on, um, that you would like to add to your arsenal? Oh, wow. If, 
I mean, all of it. Uh, uh, unreal. <laughs> Only because you, you get these buzzwords. Um, uh, unreal looks incredible. Uh, and I think what's great about Unreal is you're in the pipeline to whoever's doing the volume. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, your, your assets, you know, you're, you're directly working on things that could go in front of the camera. Uh, I mean, I love all of it. You know, they all have their own. Um, I'd love to learn uh, ZBrush and Moi 3D looks good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, it's um, you know, just different jobs, uh, different software for different jobs. Yeah. But yeah, I did, there's no time. You know, it's... Uh, no. I, I, I enjoy the work more than learning new packages. So I just, uh, what I learn is dictated by whichever job I'm on and I don't know what I'll be doing next year. So who knows? I, I love that. And I think for me, that is the way to approach a career or anything mm-hmm. in general, because as the modern day has shown, like there is almost information out there for every single thing. Yeah even if people know all stuff, they not necessarily will be amazing mm. or create awesome things. Like there's still something else that needs to be inputted by us yeah. to make it to that thing. And the focus, I guess, if you are perhaps investing a lot of time in learning absolutely every single corner of something, yeah. maybe you are losing that bit of flair because that energy should be put into that. Yeah. Um, but a friend of mine referred you- to those kind of people as professional amateurs where... Yes, you spend all your time learning and perfecting, but then the other part of the job is taking a brief, taking direction. So you know, I've been on jobs where they've hired people who can do these insanely beautiful pictures, renders, uh, but then the art director will say, "Well, we can't build this," you know, and then they they've got panic because they're so good at doing that specific thing. It's more like illustration as opposed to. some pipeline design and no disrespect to anyone doing that kind of work, but there's just different um, ways of working mm-hmm. and producing the most beautiful piece of work is a really amazing skill. But if it, if it, if it doesn't work for the director or if the production designer can't build it, then it's mm-hmm. a book color, cover illustration as opposed to um you know, pipeline design work. Mm-hmm. And obviously throughout your career, you, as you've shown, you've seen the differences in advancement technology, or maybe just how we use the tools mm-hmm. to make things. What do you think is the constant or the true role of a concept designer? And um, have you seen that shift at all? Like, has that shifted? Or has that always kind of been a constant since you've been a professional? I, it, it, I, it's definitely shifting. Um, I think the the distance between the art department and VFX and post has receded massively. Mm-hmm. With uh, so when I, I started, my first job was the last job I ever used markers on the job. You know, in my day to day workflow, uh, it was just at the um, the beginning of everyone going laptops, digital yeah. and computers. So. I've I've been I, I feel quite lucky to have straddled the final minutes of the analog concept. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean I mean, that that's coming back. People love that kind of work, and I still do. Yeah. Uh, but it's not quick enough for work. So you know, at that point we were very much in the art department. But now, if we do a design and it's approved, we've probably done it in three D. So we're we're talking to previs, giving them. Uh, our geo so they can put it into the previs or you know vfx um i guess you know it, it in, a, in a way it's good because we concept designers and artists now have the ability to do the early doors pitch work on a movie if that works out you might go into production and you're working on the the sets being built um and on the last job i was on i did pre production production and then i did i did post uh i did some match shot designs and some you know because I, the the director and the production designer liked what i did at the other two points you you know the the good part of 
this shifting responsibilities. You get to do a bit of everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's in some ways it's bad because sometimes the the VFX department can design the stuff that's in their realm where the production designer might lack us to do it. But sometimes you get to do you know a bit of all of it. Mm. And what would you say has, or maybe not, but has there been a constant that you've always seen that's never changed? A constant designer and artist has or needs um, to either provide or at least have within themselves to be successful? Yeah, I guess um, you. Uh, it always helps having good people skills. I, I guess people skills is the constant you need to have mm. um, because you, you have to work with people who are maybe pretty chipper and happy in pre-production because everything is okay. And then their lives are going to get turned upside down when they're they're shooting, and then they're going to be more stressed. They're going to be potentially a bit shorter with you. They're going to have less time to give you feedback. So you, I, I think, you have to have the people skills to know when they're having a really bad day. <laughs> it's gonna it's way worse than the day you're having drawing if they're off managing budgets and people. Say that, you know, the production designer might be handling a really hard director. A producer is on them for budgets. And, and if, you're, if, you, if you go to them and you're moaning about if they've given you a prop that you don't want to do, and I've seen it happen where people go, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this. It's almost like it's below them. Mm. You know, have, just have a bit of understanding of what everyone else is going through. And if so, you spend two or three days designing something you don't want to do. I, it's not it's not the end of the world, you know, just try and look at the people in, in the pipeline, look at the people before and after you and think about their days. So mm. The, the one, if you, if there is a constant, it's good people skills and knowing mm. just reading the room, I guess. And from your experience, because obviously one beautiful thing that I've appreciated over the times that I've worked within teams and doing the things that I've done, is meeting people, speaking to people, and the vast variety of different personalities and the way to communicate and all the nuances and everything else that contributes to that. Mm. It's fascinating. Yeah. And it never bores me. And it's always like, wow, cool. Even the good and the bad and the ugly, all that it rolled into one. Um, from yourself, like, how did you develop those skills? Like, is that something that, like, like with almost everything else, like, was it on the job? Yeah. Or is that almost, would you say, part of your nature? I, I mean, I'm a fairly agreeable person, which sort of holds me back and keeps me afloat at mm -hmm. the same time. Uh, I say I learned those skills by making many, many mistakes. And we all have egos and you can let your ego get out of control. But, you know, the older you get, the more you can control, you can manage that. Um, but I, you know, when you, when you start and you're in the art department and you meet the designer and the art director, you have no idea what they've had to do to get to that job. And you have no idea what their day has been. The, the battles with a budget and a producer and trying to, you know, schedule. You could be building a set um, that's up in, say, three months' time. <clears throat> and the, the actor who's going to be on that set, his or her schedule changes. So that set comes forward by a month. That's huge. And that's a... Mm. A total, I mean, it's more than a headache for them. That's kind of, right, okay, well, we'll build over here. We'll build a, a half the set that we need, you know, whatever. They're, they're, that's really hard grown-up work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you go to a designer that day and you, you have a complaint about whatever, the temperature of the room or something, you know, and, and people do it, they're going to they're gonna lose it with you. So... Yeah, uh, you have you. I'm sure you've done the same. I'm sure everyone listening has done the same. You have to make a couple of mistakes. <clears throat> you know, you're going to be a bit of a dick at some point, mm -hmm. uh, but you just have to learn from it and, and move mm. forward. And you'll find there's a post 35 years of age into your 40s. You do. You've you've done enough. You've read enough rooms to know <laughs> when you can get away with being a dick and when you can just like sit down and do the work because you're being paid well to do something you yes. love just grow up yeah. and, and do it 
No, no, for sure. And I think, yeah, it is one of those where it's one of those that you just, you will learn from mileage. Like your XP will go up with every conversation that you have, every mistake that you make, every win that you have as well. Yeah. Um, it, it is something that I guess, although there's a lot of stuff out there where I guess you can kind of mask how to communicate well or sound like you're communicating well, but you really, it's very hollow. Um, a lot of it is just do it live get yourself stuck in to yeah and totally yeah. i mean it's hard now post covid i think everyone's a bit more introverted and i feel really lucky to have had the bulk of my career pre covid in a room with other people mm -hmm. because if i was trying to develop my team building skills my management skills at home over zoom i that's not that's really really hard so i i, I worry slightly that we're, we're going to be a there's going to be a generation of introverted people who will will struggle with teamwork, but there's there's nothing you can do apart from taking a deep breath, being thrown in at the deep end, and making a whole bunch of mistakes. You just yeah. have to make sure your mistakes aren't catastrophic, you know, yeah. career ending yeah. mistakes. Yeah, which they won't be. You, you can't yeah. unless you go in there with, you know, I don't know violently attacking people you're not going to make a catastrophic <laughs> mistake you might look a bit daft but you know no one cares really you know you're no you just move on i'm glad you mentioned that because i mean i guess by the sounds of it like with the, the way films are made in general it just seems like a constant series of adjustments or mistakes or um failures for whatever reason and there's constantly rebuilding from that yeah and yeah you kind of answered this um just now but um just to clarify even more like what is the worst mistake you can make even and almost is it a case of the part of the job is maybe the secret is learn to embrace the mistakes and how do you you know like build on top of that yeah um if i i'm trying to think of i mean i've made my fair share i guess the the, and I mentioned earlier that the biggest mistake you can make is not listening to what they're asking you to do. When you do that, you really spook people. If if they're paying you, um, you know, they they have a, a finite amount of money to hire you for however long. And if you're not performing, they they get spooked. And, you know, not listening to people. And I've, you know, I've done it where they, they've listed stuff. And maybe I did. I forgot to write it down. I forgot to do something. When you when when you present some work to a production designer or a director, and you haven't listened, the color just drains from their face, and they don't necessarily shout at you, but you you like oh yeah, you're, you're biting oh. your fist. You think, <laughs> and they say, well, why didn't you do this? It's like, yeah, I forgot. I and you did say, yep, yeah, I'm sorry, but that that it just doesn't cut it. So. Um, the worst mistake you can make is not listening to who you're working for, because you know you know when you've scared them, you know. And I, I think you have to. Uh, designers and directors are working so hard, um, and they're human, and they're they're paranoid, and they have all the all the anxieties you have. They just have it on a a way bigger scale, yes. you know, with different people putting pressure you know cracking their skull at the studio squeezing down on them so you have you just have to make their life easier and, and not listening mm. makes their life way harder that well said and it's definitely advice that should be heeded um and to be honest it's one of those like when you're growing up you're always told when it's like you know let's go back to school times mm. Um, you've got assignments, you've got essays to hand in do it early but we never do we do it last minute and we always learn the hard way and then you remember shit i was told then i never listened and yeah. maybe something about being about growing up where you listen when it's too late sometimes yeah but at yeah. the same time if people are able to listen now get that in there or have it at least in the front of your mind yeah when these mistakes are happening you can categorize it and understand what's happening and then just move on and i yeah. think yeah like you said you nailed it like it is a case of if you're going to fail understand why and then just move on yeah. and try not to do it again or at least understand what are the causes behind it? So mm -hmm. you can kind of like if have that fire extinguisher. So if you see the fire, put it out before it spreads to the whole room and everyone's got to wear gas masks and all sorts. Yeah. Um, Matt, one thing we haven't spoke about yeah. is your amazing work, your ah. exceptional work. Your, your, your body work is just like 
always see you posting stuff, always check your work regularly just to see as a source of inspiration and as a benchmark because it truly is exceptional. And I was lucky enough to attend your talk at Concept 101, um, which gave me a lot of cheat codes that I was looking for. Oh, that's um, great. I'm really glad to hear that. It was it truly was. Um, I, I'm in the process of like just rebuilding my portfolio yeah. to something that's very dated. So something that's more accurate and more representative of what I can do. Sure. That's and, you and everyone else I know. We're, oh, yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like the way you do things um, and the reasons why you did them and how you explain them, that was absolute gold. So I do thank you oh, for that's really good to hear. Thank sharing you. that knowledge. Um, why hard surface? How did you get into props? Obviously, you explained how you got into the industry and the things you did. Yeah. Was it just as a result of that's what they needed or has that been your passion? I think I, I, I thought about that a lot recently um it, it's definitely been my passion it's kind of been i was at a years when i was a teenager i had uh the book it's called the book of alien it's the making of alien and i was obsessed with ron cobb and hr geiger obviously and predictably as we all were at some point and i looked at geiger's work and i loved it and i thought you know i'd love to do that kind of thing but i his work was so beautiful i couldn't see a way to to do it i could like it was airbrush and i thought like i mean i tried airbrushing and i just couldn't it was like this it was completely unattainable and i was also, i was obsessed with ron cobb's work and that was markers and pens and i had those at home and i bought the pack of markers i had pens and that just felt like i was i was at a, a crossroad and i could have gone into dark creaturey stuff or I could have gone techy and I just I forked that way and mm. I I just didn't stop um and the stuff I do in work now is what I was doing in school but just on a you know a, a on a on a different level a different yeah. level of understanding uh but I love I love tech I love engineering uh I I find engineering absolutely beautiful when a piece of machinery works and folds and the pistons compress. So it's just, it's just my thing. And again, I'm, I'm in too deep. <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, if I had another lifetime, I would, I would go down the set brush creature, but I just, I, I'm a natural fit for doing that kind of thing. Wow. So it's, it's interesting. Like the kind of both similar, like although one's organic. Yeah. One's yeah, hard yeah. surface, but it's all like when you're doing creatures, it's all like anatomies or mechanics and whatnot. So you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you had any opportunities to do any creature stuff, or has it always been whatever like your specialty? Yeah, is, not really. I mean, I've I've done costume and creature stuff when it's been mechanical. Mm -hmm. uh, I I just can't compete. I've got friends who are creature designers, and I look at their work and I think why you know why would i why would i touch what what you guys do yes. it's not i i could get there if i had the time uh but but i don't and um mm -hmm. you know it's it's nice to look at other people's work and admire it and not be in competition yes. just go i really dig what you do you know there's like a there's a calmness and a peaceness to appreciating mm. something you you know maybe i'll do it in my spare time but i'm not gonna touch it i'm Give me a spaceship or a prop, then you know I'll, I can do that for you today. Music to my ear, spaceship <laughs> or a prop, I'm done forever. That's it. That's all I need on the menu. Um, again, not only amazing body of work, a rich, storied career in terms of the projects you've worked on. Um, which has been uh, maybe favorites a wrong word to use, mm. or maybe a cheaper question to ask because I'm sure each one has its merits and pros and cons, and each one has led to something different yeah. in your career but which ones really stand out for you or you're close with in terms of how they um, affected you i i mean it, it's really exciting to think that the last project i did in my 40s was the most excited i've ever been in work um alien was was fantastic i mean i maybe i can come back and talk about that in a year's time but it was um that just meant so much and um it was the first time in years i felt like i was part of a, a community of people working on the same thing 
Mm. Um, for whatever reason, the concept team got in touch and stayed in touch, and we 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 text and we we zoom whenever we can, even though we're off the job. That's amazing. Uh, it was a combination of subject matter I love, a really great team, um, great concept guys, great director, uh, great production designer, and uh, um, uh, being given the stuff I'd like to do. Like the, you know, in a script, there's a hit list of what needs to be done, and Fede just gave me the the stuff I, if if I could have cherry picked, which you never get to do. Yeah. Um, I would have I would have picked the stuff they gave me to do. So, wow. Uh, and it's quite nice, you know, at this juncture in my career to do one of the most exciting jobs I've done. But as you say, they're all deeply personal. Um, I worked on a, a movie. It's a different league. I worked on a thing called Now You See Me Too, um, which I've, I've never seen. I don't know if anyone's seen it. I haven't seen it. No, no, no. Like, it, like, why would you? But it was like, the most fun job with the, the best like, people. And the, the stuff I did on that was not in my wheelhouse. It was sort of contemporary interiors. But the team I was with, they were like, really great friends. And I, kinda, I, I really enjoyed that job. But I've never seen it. You've never seen it. What? <laughs> But it's like it was it was a fun thing to do. Awesome. So, generally um, they're good. You get you get the odd bad yeah. one, which we won't talk about, but on the whole that, they're all fair enough. They're all fun. Uh, what kind of um things do you enjoy being asked to do? Like do you have a certain preference of like and it might not be like a specific type of prop yeah. or vehicle or whatever maybe like a certain type of task or certain problem that you like solving it do you have like a favorite the the the, the thing i've grown to absolutely adore and it's quite a i get i'd say it's quite a rare thing but i've had it four three or four times where i've designed a vehicle and then they've got me to design all the interiors as well and moving like boxes around to try and make it work and then your your brain's going well. The, you have to design a really cool exterior, but it has to accommodate all these different corridors and windows or fixed points. So when I get to do that, it, it's it's one of the hardest things to do. I think to do it because you, as with everything, you have to do it relatively quickly because you're on a time frame. Uh, but I and then you're also working with VFX and you're working with the production designer on the the physical build. So that that's like magic hour for me, but it, it's quite it's a rare thing. But it's kind of it brings together all the different things I enjoy doing. Awesome, Matt. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I've got a million more questions to want to ask you. So <laughs> we'll do, we'll I do guess another one next year. Yeah, I was just going to say, it definitely gives us enough content for the next one. And um, any final thoughts or words before we wrap up? No, not really. I, I mean, I'm I can't remember my Instagram, but I'm there if you want to get in touch uh but um yeah i i really enjoyed doing 101 just to touch on that it was great to meet you i met a bunch of people i'm sort of vaguely in touch with online and then you people come up and they you don't recognize them and they say oh uh, and you know and i yeah. i i haven't done a lot of that kind of thing so i i'd like to do more because i enjoyed that'd be awesome it was a great day so yeah, yeah that, that, that's all i've got what well, a pleasure chatting with you um Again, you are the, the knowledge you give, um, not only the talk, but even speaking to you today, it definitely is going to the cheat code chapter of my oh, notebook. That's, because that's, that's a lot of really cool nice takeaways. to hear. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Uh, pleasure talking. We'll speak again soon. You too. Take care. Thanks. A huge thanks to Matthew for his incredible insights and for reinforcing the benefit of sticking to what you love. Hit the links attached to see what he's up to and give him a follow. And remember, you can work on your own creative journey by heading over to LearnSquared.com. I've been your host, Aaron Danda. Till next time.